This is a 13 inch Retina MacBook Pro from late 2012. Unfortunately it's completely dead. Nothing happens when pressing the power button, I can't even get it to turn on. If I open the laptop, disconnect the battery and plug in the charger, then I can get it to turn on, but the battery isn't recognised, the trackpad doesn't work, and some of the keys don't respond. So in this video I'm going to be replacing the entire top case, and hopefully getting this MacBook Pro back up and running again. The top case I bought on eBay comes complete with battery, keyboard, trackpad and speakers. Due to the way it's designed, top case replacement on a MacBook Pro means completely dismantling the entire laptop. So it's not something you want to try if you're not comfortable working inside computers. And it's not something I'd recommend you do unless your MacBook isn't working. Since it's quite intricate and there's always a risk of damaging your hardware during the disassembly and reassembly. With that said, let's get started. First, on the bottom cover there are 10 pentalobe screws to be removed. The two on the back are shorter, so when replacing them, make sure that they go back in the right place. After removing the screws, the bottom case can be removed by holding it at the back and rotating it up. There are still clips holding the case in the middle, so it may take a little bit of effort to lift it off. Now, before doing anything else, it's necessary to disconnect the battery. On the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro, the battery is connected via a board in the middle. It's covered by a piece of plastic which can just be peeled off, as it's only held in place by adhesive. There are now three Torx T6 screws to remove. Once the three screws have been removed, I'm using some tweezers to lift off this plastic piece which is held in place by adhesive and covers another Torx T6 screw underneath. Once that screw has been removed, the battery connector board can be gently lifted up, and there's a small connector board underneath that can just be lifted out using tweezers. That's the battery disconnected, so it's now time to disconnect a lot of cables. I'm starting with the I.O. connector cable, the connector can be prized up on each side using a plastic spudger and then the cable lifted up away from the board. Next the SSD cable. Again I'm inserting a spudger under the connector to gently pry it up and disconnect it from the board. Then the SSD tray can be removed by pressing the middle in and lifting it out. The SSD is here on the other side. Next I'm using the tip of the spudger to disconnect the left speaker. The connector just pulled straight up from its socket. The speaker itself meanwhile is held in place with three Torx T5 screws. Once the screws have been removed, the speaker can be lifted up and removed from the case. I don't actually need these speakers since the new top case I bought already has them but I'm including it just to show how it's done. Over onto the other side, the right speaker connector is hidden away under the headphone jack cable. I'm using a spudger here again to pry the connector up from its socket on the logic board. Then I use the other end of the spudger to lift the right speaker cable straight up from its socket. Just like the left speaker, the right speaker is held in place by three Torx T5 screws. And then it can also be lifted out and removed from the case. Now moving on to the Wi-Fi Bluetooth board. There are three antenna connectors which can be disconnected by putting the end of a spudger under the end of the cable and pushing them straight up away from their sockets. Be careful with these as they're quite fragile and easily damaged. 
The board itself can then be removed by undoing a single Torx T5 screw, then angling it up slightly and pulling gently while wiggling it from side to side. Next it's back over to the other side of the board to remove the display connector. It's secured in place by a metal lever which can be rotated up with a plastic spudger. Then holding onto the pull tab, slide the connector straight out of its socket parallel to the board. Before the display can be removed, there's one final connector which is for the webcam. This can be slid out of its socket by gently moving each side a little at a time using a spudger, then the cable can be derouted from on top of the fan where it's held in place by adhesive. The webcam and antenna cables can then be bent up out of the way in preparation for removing the display. On each side is a small hinge cover which can be removed by undoing a single Torx T5 screw and then lifting it off with tweezers or fingers. Next there are three hinge screws on each side, all of which are Torx T8. I'm just undoing two screws on each side leaving the outermost screw in place for the time being. With just one screw remaining on each side, I've opened the laptop screen to about 90 degrees and then placed it on its side so that I can remove the remaining two screws while holding the laptop steady with my other hand. Once the screws have been removed, the two parts can be separated by rotating the lower part away from the top. Now there are still more cables to be detached before the logic board can be removed. Beginning with a cable connecting the I.O. board to the main logic board. This can be slowly walked out of its socket little by little with the tip of the spudger. Next the keyboard backlight connector, which I'm prying straight up from its socket using the flat end of a spudger. The microphone socket has a little plastic retaining flap which needs to be rotated up to release the cable, which can then be pulled from its connector using the pull tab. The keyboard connector is hidden under this plastic pull tab, which can be lifted up to reveal the connector. Then the retaining flap can be rotated up and the cable disconnected by pulling it straight out using the pull tab. Next to the keyboard connector is the trackpad connector. This also has a retaining flap which needs to be rotated up to release the cable. Unfortunately I can't pull this cable out now as my pull tab is missing, so it will have to stay in place until I remove the logic board. Next the right fan connector has to be removed by flipping up the retaining flap and then sliding the connector from its socket. I don't actually need to remove the fan itself, but Apple cunningly hid a screw under the cable. Now there are 8 Torx T5 screws securing the logic board to the upper case, marked by the red circles on this image. I've sped this part up for the sake of brevity. There are two more Torx T5 screws securing the logic board to the I.O. board, again marked by red circles. There's one size 00, zero crosshead screw here in the back corner. Finally, before the logic board can be lifted out, there are two more Torx T5 screws holding the MagSafe board. 
At last, the logic board can be lifted from the side opposite the ports and removed from the case. I had to be careful here to move it back slightly while lifting since the trackpad connector was still in its socket. The only other part I need from this upper case is the I.O. board. It's held in place by two more Torx T5 screws. Moving straight over to the new top case, the first thing that I did was transplant the I.O. board and replace the two screws. Then it was time to install the logic board in the new case. This was quite tricky to do as I had to take care not to trap any of the cables. I found it easiest to install the side with all the ports on first, then lower the other side into place. Then it's a matter of replacing all 8 Torx screws securing the logic board to the upper case. taking care not to forget the one that's hidden under the fan cable. Then replace the two Torx screws securing the logic board to the I.O. board. And then the little Phillips head screw in the corner. With the screws replaced it's time to go around the board reattaching some cables. Starting with the right speaker cable then the microphone cable which needs to be pushed all the way in and then the retaining flap closed. Then the headphone jack connector which can be pushed straight down onto its socket. Then the I.O. board cable which I pushed in using the flat end of a spodger. The left speaker cable can be rerouted along the back of the battery. and then the connector pushed straight down onto its socket. The keyboard backlight connector can be placed over its socket and pushed straight down until it clicks into place. The right fan connector can be pushed back into its socket and the retaining flap rotated down. Before reattaching the keyboard and trackpad connectors, I gave the contacts a quick clean with a Q-tip dampened with isopropyl alcohol to remove any grime. Then push the connectors back into their sockets and close the retaining flaps. Next I reattach the I.O. board data cable which is just the case of positioning the connector over the socket and pushing down until each end clicks into place. I slid the Wi-Fi Bluetooth card back into its socket at a slight angle. It's spring loaded so it will drop into place by itself. Then I replace the single screw. The SSD tray can be placed back into its hollow under the trackpad. Then the connector can be reattached to the logic board by placing the connector over the socket and pressing it straight down. To reattach the screen, it was the exact opposite of what I did to remove it. Place the laptop on its side and replace one screw on the left and one screw on the right while securing the screen with my other hand. Once both screws have been replaced, the lid can be closed and the remaining screws can be replaced making sure that the screws on the right go back through the grounding loop as they were before. At this point I noticed that I'd forgotten to replace the two screws in the MagSafe board, so I replaced them now. Replacing the display cable is just the case of pushing it straight into its socket parallel to the board and then folding down the retaining clip to hold it in place. I then replace the hinge covers on each side along with the rubber screw covers.
I then went back to the other side of the board to reattach the webcam cable to the top of the fan and slide the connector back into its socket. The next part was probably the most difficult part of the entire repair, reattaching the antenna cables to the Wi-Fi card. The connectors are tiny and they have to be in exactly the right place before pushing them down for them to click into place. I found it very helpful to use tweezers for this. All that was left to do now was to reattach the battery connector, starting with the interposer board, then bending the battery connector board back into place over the top and securing with a silver torque screw. before replacing the plastic cover and screwing it into place. I then just had to replace the last two screws on the battery connector. Before replacing the bottom cover, I wanted to test the laptop to make sure that it was working. After pressing the power button, I heard the familiar Apple chime for the first time since the laptop stopped working. And then the Apple logo appeared on the screen and it booted into macOS. After testing the trackpad, keyboard and Wi-Fi was all working, I powered the machine off again to replace the lower case. If you look at the inside of the bottom cover, you'll see these two black plastic pieces. These clip into slots on the top case between the battery. When replacing the bottom cover, it's necessary to press down gently in these areas for the clips to reattach. In total, this repair took a couple of hours. Because it entailed taking the entire MacBook apart, it's about as extreme a repair as you can get without getting into component level repair. But it was worth it to get this previously dead MacBook up and running again.